All right. So welcome, everyone. Um, just a word to the people that are in the room with me. Everybody can hear what's going on. So keep the noise down. Um, so today we're going to talk about the self-advocacy startup toolkit. More power, more control over our lives. Yeah. <laughs> so um, if we could go to the next page. So what is ZARTAC? Well, ZARTAC stands for Self-Advocacy Resource and Technical Assistance Center. It's an online clearinghouse for information, a partnership between regional technical assistance centers, and it's funded by the Administration for Community Living, ACL. Next uh, page, please. So Zartac has a 12 person advisory committee that helped create best practice tools and provide ideas and advice about issues and help write papers about issues. So uh, what I want you to realize is that um, technology has changed a lot since the very first toolkit was made and the new toolkit now has links to videos and websites that you can click on to view. And we would like to thank the self-advocates from around the country for creating such awesome videos and websites and for letting us use them. And they really are helping to spread the word about self-advocacy because ultimately that's what it's all about, right? Is self-advocacy. So, um, if you would, Juliana, I would love to just show them um, like a video from the web, from the toolkit. Maybe something about self-advocacy so that they can get a flavor that, that the toolkit is not just something that you read, but it's actually something that you can experience. And it, it's a great toolkit and a lot of fun to use. So go ahead, start us up. Self-advocacy means to speak up. Speaking up for your rights, no matter what the issue or the concern is. To speak for oneself and speak for others. Well, I have my own voice. I speak up for myself. Standing up for your rights and not relying on staff or your support staff to uh, make decisions for you. The ability to be independent, live your life to its fullest extent. We took issues like uh, we'll, we'll work, we'll pay. When you got control of your life, of your everyday affairs, means given the ability to, to have choices in my life. It's not just about information sharing, it's about being in the community. I work really hard in the community because of my unique disability to get the word out that people like us should be in the community. Speaking up for yourself, but also taking responsibility for your things. Being able to know what you want and then being able to go for it and, and having somebody else that believes in it that's able to help you. I'm going to fight for those that are like me or it don't matter, it's just I just don't like people taking advantage of. They want to get the word out that they want something out the way. As much as everybody tries to help people with various kinds of disabilities, we're the ones who really know what we need. For years, the voice of the people with intellectual disability were never heard. Decisions were made for them. If it doesn't come from us, it comes from people who don't have an intellectual disability. and. They don't actually have the experience to talk about it. The professional they can listen to us more, but they don't know as well as we do what we want to do. Other people will decide what you will do. If you are not at the table, you don't know what those people are going to decide. A part of being a so advocate is to get out there and start networking. And if you don't know how to do that, you should go and ask a self-advocate person that knows how to do it, and they'll help you. There's tons of barriers out there, 
when added to more barriers are the biggest thing. The biggest thing is being included in the community with society and it's inclusion within college, schools. We came out here to learn from y'all anyway, and that's what we want people to understand. What we need help and, and all that from y'all. That's what we want. I like to be out, helping people, and to teach people. I learned to speak speak up and not be ashamed of who who I am. Just like the civil rights movement before us, we try to do things to help people speak out for what they want and do what they believe in. We just wanted to let everybody know just because you have a disability doesn't mean you're less than or you don't know or you're not committed to something. We need a voice. We need to get people to listen. It's really important that we speak up and tell people what is wrong in this world and so that we can make it better and we can make a change. Yay! Great video on what is self-advocacy. really is. So if we could, Juliana, I would love to show them one of the um, exercises because we didn't, like I said, we didn't want it to just be a read it thing. We wanted it to be interactive. We wanted it to be fun to use. We wanted it to be very user friendly. And we also wanted it to be where one person can use it at a time or it could be used in a group dynamic as well. So um, you might want to consider if you have a self advocacy group that may, may be taking and using different pieces of the toolkit every month as part of your meeting so that the information gets shared with a lot of people. So Juliana, when you find that activity, if you would, um, if you don't mind, just kind of explaining the activity. I will do so. On this page, it has a series of questions. And what it allows people to do is, in, you can do it with yourself or, or with the group, but the questions ask you about self-advocacy. So here's a list of questions that you can ask yourself and you can ask a group of people. And you can even break, take a group of people and break them into tables and they could answer it as well. I mean, there's just a lot of different ways you can use it so that it's very interactive. Right? So that being shown, if we could go back to page four of the um, PowerPoints. So the self-advocacy startup kit toolkit. First of all, what's in it is a, a description of what is self-advocacy, is uh, the history of the self-advocacy movement. There's material for starting your own group. Um, there's explains how to work on issues. There's a section that talks about self-advocates and self-determination. And then there's a section on advisor issues and then there's a section on resources. Next slide, please. So what is self-advocacy? Um, that's a big question, right? So um, in this toolkit, it starts out by saying that what self-advocacy is, it's about independent groups of people with all types of disabilities working together for justice. We help each other take charge of our lives and fight discrimination because there's a lot of discriminations. There's a lot of barriers out there. So we help each other to take charge of our lives. It teaches us how to make decisions and choices that affect our lives and how we can be more independent. It teaches us about the toolkit teaches us about our rights, about, um, learning about our rights and we learn what we have to do to keep our rights and the way we learn about advocating is by helping each other gain confidence 
to speak out for what we believe in. There are self-advocates all across the country. And here's what some advocates from Tennessee said about self-advocacy that we thought was so powerful. Um, the people first of Tennessee said that self-advocacy means taking responsibility for your life, learning to ask questions until you can understand what is happening, learning to solve the problems that stand in the way of doing what you want to do. Powerful statement, right guys? Yes, it is. So self-advocacy can help you become an active voice for yourself and speaking for yourself. And it can help the groups in your state to speak up so that voices of people with disabilities will be heard loud and strong. And, and we can become a political force. Uh, we can become future leaders, um, not only in our local groups, but in our state and nationally. And that's, that's what's happening, you know? I mean, that's what the toolkit is all about. So the next question that it says is, who is considered a self-advocate? Well, you are. You're a self-advocate if you've ever spoken up for what you believe in. You're a self-advocate if you've taken responsibility for your life in some ways. You're a self-advocate if you have ever questioned people's expectations and uh, goals for you. You're a self-advocate if you've ever joined a self-advocacy group and believe that the group's work is going to make a, a life better for people with disabilities. Even if you've never done any of these things, you can become a self-advocate by getting involved, by starting today, by using the toolkit. So let's talk a little bit about beliefs, values, and principles. So self-advocacy, it means speaking for oneself. It's, it, it is not saying, hey, I have a disability, so give me this and that, give me everything. Instead, it's becoming, you know, just like everybody else and getting the same rights as everybody else. So um, self-advocacy is speaking or acting for yourself. It means deciding what is best for you and taking charge of getting it. It means standing up for your rights as a person, right? So, you know, the beliefs and principles can just, it goes from there, you know? Self-advocacy movement is based off of beliefs, values, and principles. And they have included such things as we are people first. I'm not a disability, I'm a person. We have the right to choose the services we want. People with disabilities want to live in the community. We don't want to be locked away. We don't want to be segregated or con put in congregated settings. These are just few of the beliefs and values and principles that are most important to us. It's important to talk about our beliefs, values, and principles when creating your own self-advocacy group. Knowing what is important to you as a self and as a group and helping you to reach your goals and helping the group to reach their goals. Goals have attract more people who believe in the same thing you do, right? Now I just wanna talk just a minute about SAVE's value statements because this project came out of self-advocates becoming empowered and their value statement says people with disabilities should be treated as equals. People should be given the same decisions, choices, rights, responsibilities, and chances to speak up and empower themselves. People should be able to make new friendships, renew old friendships, just like everyone else. People should be able to learn from their mistakes. You know, there's that whole dignity of risk, right? Right. So, you know, I mean, these are just some of the things that you might want to want to talk about, you know, that that we are people first and we are able to make our own decisions. And we do believe in value as a person. We are each value and valuable because we are people and having other people believe in us as a person. You know, nothing about us without us. 
Look at our abilities, not our disabilities. Disability is a natural part of the life cycle, human life cycle. And dignity of risk, you have the right to fail and learn from that, right? Presume competency and expectations. Do not judge me by my disability. I can do more than you think, right? right. I mean, these are important things as a person with a disability <clears throat> that we need to think about, you know, empowerment, equal opportunity, learning and living together, non-labeling. You know, I'm not that woman in the wheelchair. I'm Sheree Mitchell. I'm Sheree Mitchell and I am valuable as a person. You know, and, and we deserve equal pay for a hard day's work. Equal expectations for doing the same thing. Everyone is a part of the community. And a community that leaves one behind isn't a community. Listen to individual wants and needs. Respond to what people want in their lives. Do not let providers decide, right? Real friendships, not paid friends like staff. Being treated equally, no bullying, tolerance and acceptance, right? So again, these are just some of those beliefs, values, and principles, because we've got the power, just like the slide says. Yes, we do. So going to the next slide, please. History of self-advocacy, a brief history of the self-advocacy movement. So a short history of the self-advocacy movement. The self-advocacy movement started in the 1960s, actually in the country of Sweden, a group of people without, group of people with and without disabilities went out together in their community. And the members of the groups were allowed to have typical life experiences and allowed to make their own choices and mistakes. Later, the Swedish Parent Association started a national conference so that people who participated and similar clubs could talk about their concerns. Many people with and without disabilities became interested in having their own conference. Um, in 1974, a national conference called First Convention for Mentally Handicapped in North America was held in British Columbia and focused on self-advocacy. And many people from Oregon went and decided to hold their own conference. And the People First Movement started in Oregon on January 8th of 1974. And it started at a meeting to plan for a conference. And at that one meeting, one man talked about being labeled as mentally retarded. And he said, I want to be known as a person first. That's a powerful statement. People First was chosen as the name for the convention held in October of 1974. And people now consider the R word to be offensive. And many self-advocates have worked hard to remove that word from legal documents and stop people from using it. Self-advocates groups started to pop up all over the world during the next 10 years. And some of the state groups are called People First. Uh, I, Sheree Mitchell, am a member of People First of Georgia. Other groups go by different names, such as the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network or the Youth Action Council of Arizona. No matter what the name, their goals are always the same. They want to help people with disabilities to speak up for their rights. As the self-advocacy movement grew, people started advocating for their rights to get the president of the United States to sign into law the Americans with Disabilities Act, known as the ADA. And that was a pretty significant and important uh, law. 475 people with disabilities went to the White House to protest. I, I know of one person in this room and who is also a member of the Zartec Advisory Board, Board Bernard Baker was one of those 475 people. And some people got off their wheelchairs and assisted devices and crawled up the stairs of the Capitol. And Bernard was one of those people. 
Yes, he was. So SABE is an activity group and in the United States that reaches people all over the country. Local, lo many local self-advocacy groups in each state support SAVE, which again stands for Self-Advocates Becoming Empowered. Self-advocacy is a civil rights movement led by people with disabilities and started by people with disabilities. On August the 7th of 1991, over 800 self-advocates from across the United States and Canada met in Nashville, Tennessee, and they gathered for the second annual North American People First Conference they elected a steering committee, and that became the board of directors for self-advocates becoming empowered. Just going on with a little more history, SAVE was organized by dividing the United States up into nine different regions, and each region has two regional reps and two alternates, so that if the rep isn't able to attend, they fill in. This gives the organization complete representation from all of the nine regions of the United States. During the SAVE National Conference, board members and officers are elected. And um, they, like I said, there are nine regions. So some of the important issues that SAVE has been, been on has been segregation, people being segregated from other people, abuse, stereotypes, Stereotypes being labeled, the labeling that people are given. Community support, that's the help that you need to live your life. Inclusion, that means being a part of the community. And speaking up for others who cannot speak up for themselves. People still face many barriers and challenges to live in the community. You know, physical challenges. You know, like no curb cuts, no uh, zero step entrances, uh, environmental, communications, yes, accessible bathrooms is one of those physical ones. Environmental, communication, and poverty. Unfortunately, a lot of people with disabilities are stuck in poverty. Where it's just, it's not right. In the past 26 years, SAVE has worked on closing institutions, filing lawsuits to end segregation and enforcing the Olmstead decision. The Olmstead decision is a law that says that services, all services should be provided in the most integrated setting, improve voting access, increase employment and fair wages, we should get paid what everybody else does, right? There should be no below minimum wage. Removing the R word. Work on policy changes in services and support. A national self-organization as the fourth partner in the DD network. We're still fighting for that one. So, you know, you can learn more about SAVE by going to their website, which is SAVE USA. So, you know, that DD network kind of leads us into who are the partners in the DD network. And one of the most important laws for people with disabilities has also been not only the ADA, but the uh, what's known as the DD Act, the Developmental Disability Assistance and Bill of Rights Act. Um, the law supports self-determination, independence, and inclusion in all parts of community living. The DD Act requires the uh, ACL and the uh, AIDD, which is the Administration on Intellectual and Developmental, Developmental Disabilities, to give support to certain organizations in each state. And they have the right, they help fight for the rights of people with disabilities. SAVE began its public policy advocacy at the federal level with AIDD in 2000 as part of its national policy. SAVE advocates for a national self advocacy organization to be the fourth and equal partner in the DD network. And today there are three DD partners, right? Um, there's the DD Council who develops uh, state plans for developmental disabilities 
fund projects in the state that help people with developmental disabilities and families have their lives and the, and they want that they want to live. Help legislators understand the needs of people with disabilities and the DD councils also, they help um, support state advocacy groups with money and leadership. So the other partners that are in the DD network in every state is what's known as the USEDS, the University Centers for Alex Excellence in Developmental Disabilities. And their jobs include doing research that proves the best way to support people and families. They train college students to work with people with disabilities. They train and help community providers work better with people with disabilities. And they share information about people with disabilities in their community. And then the other partner in the DD network is the PNA, the Protection and Advocacy, which the national version is NDRN, the National Disability Rights Network. And then every state has their PNA. Uh, they have different names in every state. Here in Georgia, they're known as the Georgia Advocacy Office. In some other states, it's like the Disability Rights of Florida or whatever, but they all have different names. But their role is to use lawyers and advocates and in institutions, group homes, and sheltered workshops to make sure services are safe and help make conditions better for people. They give information about services and programs in the state and have a way to help people access services that and, and help them you know with their rights to get those services pnas might be called another name like disability right laws or advocacy in your state so you know just look for and find out who the pna in your state is um if we can go to the next slide please ma'am so starting your own group reasons for starting your own group you know, um, we've talked about this a little earlier when we were talking about self-advocacy, but there's power in numbers, right? So um, that's really important. So finding people like you who want to make a difference and work on a certain issue. You know, there's a group of people that do a thing called Long Road Home. And Long Road Home is about Olmstead. Right. So um, it just depends. I mean, maybe that voting is important to you. And so making sure to promote voter participation and voter education might be another issue. So the next thing I want to talk about is what makes a good leader. Um, I'm turning pages here. Bear with me. So. What makes a good leader, right? Anybody want to take a stab at that one right quick? Here in the room with me. So what makes a good leader is leaders work hard. You need to understand that to make the group stronger. Officers are the elected leaders of the group, right? And so we're, we're just going to go ahead and kind of pick up with the not only what is a good leader, but picking leaders and how to support your group. You know, um, the members pick those officers when they vote and officers help to run the meetings. They keep you on track to reach your goals. And no matter how you choose your leaders, a good leader brings people together to be a leader. You must have a positive attitude. You have to care about people and want to help people. Be kind and polite to others and listen to others and what they have to say and give everyone a chance to speak, right? And getting everybody in the group involved, respect other people's ideas and find a way for everyone to be a part of the group, right? Encourage the other members to, to be leaders and to be involved and share the officer duties with others and be on time for the meetings 
meet with the other officers to plan agendas, you know, and when you're picking your officers, you know, uh, the job duties should be written in the rules of your group, which is known as your bylaws. And picking officers is one of the most important activities your group members will have to do. Um, the people they choose will be responsible for moving the group forward and reaching the group's goals. And the group should choose officers by a secret ballot, by voting for your leaders. Everyone will have an equal chance to choose the right person. So let's just talk about the roles of, of the officers just a little bit. Um, president. The president is responsible for leading the group. They make sure the group stays on track in reaching their goals. The president is also the public face of the group. They are the only ones allowed to give the official stand of the group at events or to the press. Vice president, responsible for leading the group. If the president cannot lead the group, they take over the job of the president. And when the president is not available to run the group, the secretary, responsible for recording the group activities. The secretary handles all official documents of the group, including meeting minutes, contracts, and financial documents. The treasurer is responsible for keeping track of the group's money. The treasurer updates the group on how the group is doing with money. They may work with the president and the secretary to handle all the banking needs of the group, right? So these are just some of the things that you'll find in that self advocacy toolkit. And it'll help you to uh, explain what that is and um, how to do it, right? I mean, it'll talk about things like um, what should you look for in an officer if you're gonna vote for the officer, you know? How are you gonna vote for our officers? Is the process easy to understand? Will it be fair to all the people who choose to run? Is the voting process secret so nobody knows who you voted for? Who will get to vote? You know, the right planning and supports can really make your group successful. And that's what the self-advocacy toolkit is all about. Making sure people know when and where the meeting is, is a good uh, goal for your leadership of your group. Uh, making sure the advisors know their jobs, right? So these are just some of those things that you want to uh, know about and the self-advocacy toolkit can help you with. Um, you know, bylaws are really important and you, you, you've got to work on those and make sure your group has uh, what it needs to do that, right? So self-determination is the next slide. If you could go there, please, ma'am. Oh, I must have turned two pages. I did turn two pages. Okay. Sorry about that. So working on issues, you know, you don't want to just meet to be meeting. You want to have uh, some goals for your group. And then you want to work on those goals. And so those goals are about issues. You know, it's about working together to solve the problems. And, and then there's just picking the issues because sometimes, you know, not everybody will agree on what those issues are. And you have to come to a consensus on that and strategies, you know, how we're going to work on it. So, you know, um, working on those issues can help your groups uh, go forward. It can help them to uh, grow. And working on issues gives the members hope that they can change can make real change that can make a real difference in people's lives. So how self-advocacy groups work together, um, by working together, we can solve common problems. We need to work together to get real jobs and real wages for people all across the country. Um, we wanna work together with other groups to get real jobs for people. We can meet with legislators to do speeches um, and to talk to employers and get better laws, right? People with disabilities face many problems. And some of those problems are, are, are the things that you might want to make a goal, like um, Medicaid buy-in, uh, ending sheltered workshops, making sure that we get paid the same as everybody else. These are just some of those issues. 
um, some of the issues that your group itself may want to think about. And, and again, you know, the self-advocacy tool does a really great job of, of, of bringing that out and giving you something to use to have those group discussions, like how to increase your membership, how to raise money, planning a conference or a social event, uh, our rights for personal and sexual relationships, our rights to have dreams for our lives, right? Mm -hmm. Other possible issues that your group might want to consider are closing institutions, transportation. You know, we had a, a People First chapter that got together and literally advocated for public transit where there wasn't any and got it here in Georgia. So, you know, you could do that in your state. You know, you can um, figure out ways to advocate for jobs living where you want to live, improving accessibility, learning about your rights, and self-determination rather than being controlled by staff members or family members, putting an end to abuse and neglect, right? So, you know, you can straight in your group, you can brainstorm about these issues and realize that what is hard for you might be hard for others too. And so your story is important, you know, and you want to tell your story. And then in doing that, you may be helping someone else to figure out how to fix the problems they're facing. So groups can, you know, pick issues in a lot of different ways. You can have an open mic. Uh, you can have an open meeting. Um, you can list what are all the things that people think are important. And then from that list, pick the top five, right? So, you know, now we're ready to work. You know, I mean, there's just so many issues like health care and choices in friendships and relationships, affordable and accessible transportation, quality education, community living, and, you know, helping you need, you know, help in your need to live your life, choices in the expression of sexuality, prevent physical, sexual, and emotional abuse, uh, the, the enforcement of the Americans with Disabilities Act, access to community services and supports. So, you know, when you're working with your groups, you can do these things. And some of the strategies, I just wanna to touch briefly on some of the strategies before I go forward. Some of the strategies that your group might want to use are letter writing campaigns, meeting with public officials, rallies and demonstrations, nonviolent civil disobedience that Martin Luther King uh, taught us. So, um, you know, posting on social media like Facebook and Twitter, holding a public forum on an issue, having workshops where people can learn about the issue. Sending information on the issue to lots of people. It all depends on the issue and the people you're trying to influence, right? So that being said, I think we're ready to go on to the next slide. Right, I'm turning pages quickly. So the next slide is about self-determination and the four principles of self-determination. Um, self-determination is speaking up for our rights and responsibilities and empowering ourselves to stand up for what we believe in. This means being able to choose where we work, live, and our friends, to educate ourselves and others, to work as a team to obtain common goals, to develop the skills that enable us to fight for our beliefs and to advocate for our needs and to obtain the level of independence that we desire. So I want to read you the Declaration of Self-Determination. We the people with disabilities of America met in Nashville on November the 1st, 1997 to divine self-determination as our basic civil right, including the freedoms guaranteed by our Constitution and our Bill of Rights. 
We believe self-advocates are the professionals. Uh, and ask us first. We know what works and don't work for us. So we should be the decision makers and the planners in our daily lives, living activities, and such as working and voting and conferences and leadership development and taking financial control of our services and personal dollars. As a disability community, we are all one unified voice. We include everyone. We are not special. We respect and trust each other and are willing to help each other in the fight for our rights. We also stand firm on the enforcement and protections of the ADA, which will assure self-determination for all people with disabilities. I think that is a great statement. I um, want to talk a little bit about the four principles of self-determination. Freedom. People with disabilities have the same right as everyone else. With help from others, if we need it, and that, that we can make the decisions about how we want to live our lives. People with dis disabilities do not need to give up their rights to have supports and services. Um, authority. People with disabilities should have the right to control how the money is spent for their supports and services. Support. People with disabilities should receive the supports and services they choose so they can live within the community. Support and services does not mean that people with disabilities need supervision or staffing. Right? It's, it's all about who we choose and who also agrees to, uh, to help us. Responsibility. We all have a responsibility to make sure the right supports and services are being offered to make sure people with disabilities are able to live and contribute in their communities. You know, um, so we are ready now to go to the next slide. And it is about working with advisors. What makes a good advisor? Self-advocacy groups sometimes need the help of someone to assist in running their self-advocacy group. And these people are known as advisors. It is important to meet a few times with your group members to talk about what is the role of an advisor in your group. So some of the key uh, things are that most people agree on is that advisors do not vote in the decision making by the group. Advisors do not make decisions for the group. So what makes a good advisor? Good advisors help run the meeting but won't take over. Is nice and kind. Needs to show up and be responsible and on time. Don't criticize people with disabilities for who we are. Explains what, what we do not understand. Helps with the agenda might assist people should their ID rides to the meeting in advance um, fall short, you know, is committed to the group, is understanding and patient, supports members when they want to talk about a sensitive issue, is trustworthy, right? That believe in, recognize, and foster the skills of members. An advisor understands why people join the group recognizes and legitimizes the passion of the members. Teach, a process for working together and solving problems. Connects members with the community and community resources. An advisor builds leadership, develop cultural competence, or make sure everyone understands and communicates well with people with disabilities. Supports diversity of interests within the group. Develops systems to support individual self-advocacy. Recognize and avoid conflict of interest, which is a personal gain by someone from a group decision. Avoid depending on money or an office for self-advocacy to thrive and grow. So once you decide what you need an advisor, it's important to make sure you find somebody you can trust 
And here are some simple steps to think about when looking for an advisor. Requirement. Talk with your group members and decide what you are looking for an advisor, what skill and steps they will need, what are the job requirements, do they need experience being an advisor. Use your network. Ask people you know and trust if they would be interested in being an advisor and know anybody who would be interested in being an advisor. Your friends and family know the type of support you may need and might uh, know someone they, they trust that can help with the group. You know, and once you've uh, found that person, you know, I know that people first in Georgia, one of the places they go to look for advisors is the DD Network. So you want to think about, you know, who, who's out there that supports the work that we want to do. So then comes the interview. So don't be afraid to interview several people. You should have more than one. This is an important decision and you want to make sure that you pick the right person for the job. Have a list of questions that you've put together to ask them. And here are some things you might want to ask. I'm going to give you some examples of what you might want to ask somebody who's interviewing to be an advisor. How do they feel about working with people with disabilities? Do they support the self-advocacy movement? Do they have enough time in their life to support the group as a survivor, as an advisor? So, and then once you've picked that person or, or interviewed those people, you want to make that group decision of choosing an advisor. And it's an important decision that has to be made by the whole group. Talk about each possible advisor, you know, and what you liked and what you didn't like. And be sure to vote on who will be your advisor. Everybody needs to vote. So that being said, we are ready to go to the next page in the um, booklet. The Yes, resources. Um, resources for your self-advocacy group can be found at selfadvocacyinfo.org. That is the website for Zartag. Um, it's a great website. We have all kinds of resources. And you, if you have something that you think might be a good resource, you can actually submit it for consideration to be included um, as a part of the, the resources listed there. So um, I think we're ready for the next slide. So I want to just ask a couple of people um, that are here or on the call about what part of the toolkit did they find most helpful. At the beginning of this, I talked about how I liked the fact that it wasn't just a document that you read, that it had videos and activities that you could use in your groups or your do yourself to help you figure out, you know, all the important issues. So, um, Bernard, I want to ask you, what do you think, what, what is your favorite thing about the toolkit? Like what did the, you find most I helpful? Like the whole toolkit and putting all of these to put it together. You like the whole toolkit? Yeah, and there was a lot of people that helped put it together. That advisory board is, is spectacular and made up of advocates from all across the, the, the states, the nation. So, um, is... David Fry, is he um, out there? Can we unmute David? Juliana? I'd love to hear David tell what he likes about the toolkit, if he's there. Juliana? She may have. I, I'm looking, I don't see him. Um, he might be under somebody else's name. It might be under the Vermont group. There he is. Okay. Here we go. David, are you there? I am here. So, David, can you tell everybody what you like about the toolkit? What did you find most helpful or interesting? Oh, you guys may have too many devices. Is there what you can use them? All right. 
well, uh, I hate that David didn't get to um, tell us what he liked. David, if you want to put it in chat, we can read it. If you want to chat your answer, um, maybe then we can read it. If you have any questions that you want to get asked, um, if you will put them into the chat box right now, that would be a great thing as well while we wait to see if David sends us his answer. All right, so Juliana, can you go to the next slide? I don't think that that we have an answer from um, David. So um, we're almost to the end of the uh, webinar. And the one thing I want you to know is that we have a webinar um, evaluation. And we do realize that um, a lot of the people who are on are groups. And so we've made the evaluation where you speak, you answer the question for the whole group. So some of the questions are, are you a part of a self-advocacy group? How many people were with you listening to the webinar? How many people with disabilities and how many supports or allies? Where did you or your group meet to attend this webinar? And have you visited the selfadvocacyinfo.org website, which is the website for Zartac? So you can go and visit that website before you answer the uh, questionnaire, right? So, um, have we got any questions yet, Juliana? Has anybody chatted us any questions? I don't see anything yet. Let me ask the room here with me because they don't have access to chat the questions. You, any of you guys got a question about the self-advocacy toolkit? No. Any comments about it? So maybe something you liked from today's uh, webinar i i like the fact that um doing this webinar that we get a lot more information that we didn't know about sort of tech like um when it started and where from and all that yeah and the history of the self-advocacy movement's really right. cool too right right yeah i agree with you um sophia i like that part too anybody else in the room with me have a question or a comment as do we have any questions or comments that have come up in the chat back box uh juliana nope not yet we're going to give you a, just a few more minutes and should then we we're going to wrap it? up should we try wait we got something should we try david one more time sure let's try and see if we can hear david Hopefully we won't have all the uh, back feedback that we had before. Um, I do have some questions on the chat. Yay. We, somebody what? wants you to briefly repeat the four principles of self-determination. Okay, I'm gonna have to find that because I threw all those pages are all over the place. <laughs> um, <laughs> I will find that in just one second and read it to you, I promise. Just give me a second. If we got another question while I'm looking for that. Um, people want a copy of the PowerPoint. We'll have that available. So if people need that, we can send it out. And the toolkit can be found on the, the website. Um, the selfadvocacyinfo.org, which is the uh, Zartac website. Um, so be sure and write that down right quick, selfadvocacyinfo.org. So I have the four principles. I'm going to read them to you again. The four principles of self-determination. The first principle is freedom. And what does that mean to you? You know, people with disabilities have the same rights as everybody else. And with help from others, if they need it. They can make decisions about how they want to live their lives. People with disabilities do not need to give up their rights just to have supports and services. That's not right. People should not have to give up their rights to have supports and services. The second principle of self-determination is authority. 
right? People with disabilities should have the right to control their money, how it's spent for their services and supports, right? The third principle of self-determination is support. People with disabilities should receive the supports and services they choose so that they can live within the community. And supports and services does not mean that people with disabilities need supervision or staffing. And the other thing about supports, it's about who we choose, but it's also about who's willing, right? And so it's that reciprocity, that two-way street. Um, and then the fourth principle of responsibility, we all have a responsibility to make sure the right supports and services are being offered to make sure people with disabilities are able to live and contribute in their communities. And I wanna say this about supports. I wanna add my own thoughts on supports, on responsibility. It's about taking responsibility and being truly independent, right? And responsibility can be about also giving back as well as getting and receiving, right? And um, responsibility sometimes might mean asking somebody for help and that's okay, right? So we got any other questions, Juliana? We sure do. Um, somebody asked how often the webinar is being done. So, so far we have this morning webinar and then we'll have one later on today. Right, we're offering it two different times today because different groups meet at different times and so we wanted it to be convenient. So we have the meeting that started at 10 this morning. And then what time is the afternoon when starting, Juliana? Eastern time, it'll be three o'clock. So Pacific time, it'll start at 12. Mountain time, it'll be one o'clock. Central? It'll be two o'clock and then Eastern time, three o'clock. All right, great. Next question. Uh, we have somebody from Puerto Rico. Cool. And so they're excited that they joined us. Thank you. And yeah, welcome. we're excited you're here. That is so awesome. All right, here's another one. Um, someone's asking about how to become an advisor or get an advisor for their group. Well, I think that if you are the group itself, you put the word out. We're looking for advisors who would like to apply. Then you think about organizations that do the same kind of work you do or support the kind of work that you do and maybe even uh, you know let them know that you're looking for an advisor and would love to have somebody from their organization even as well and then you see who actually uh, says I want to be an advisor and then you know there's that process that we talked about the interview process you know but first it starts with what are you looking for and putting together your list of what are you looking for in an advisor? And then putting together a list of questions to ask the, the people who've applied to be an advisor and then doing those interviews. And then after the interviews, sitting around and talking about the interview. You know, what did you like about that person? What did you not like about that person? And then uh, what, are there any concerns? or it, are there any things that you just that really stood out to you about that person and then from there figure out who you want to be the advisor and everybody voting on who's going to be the advisor right that's the great thing about people first it's about everybody having a say right yeah all right juliana any more questions i do have someone who raised their hand we can unmute them and they can tell us or all right, That's I hope, I hope we, we don't have a lot of feedback. <laughs> we have Lauren. Hi, Lauren. Lauren, are you there? Ah, uh, computers are tricky things. Lauren, I unmuted you. Do you have a microphone? If not, then Lauren, I suggest you type in your question if you don't have a microphone. 
Lauren, are you there? Like I said, computers are great when they oh. work. Yep. I think she had, um, she may have asked a question earlier. Let's see, uh, let's see, I have another one here. Okay. Um, how can an individual get on the advisory board of, at the state level? Well, Juliana, I'm gonna let you talk about that because you you did, you kind of ran the, the process when I was, when I got on the advisory board. And I'm hoping you're referring to the SARTEC advisory committee. That is, we had sent out an announcement asking for people to submit an application to be on the board. And we asked questions about how involved were you in your self-advocacy group in your state? Um, um, do, were you, are you able to have supports if you needed them? Um, how much do you know about self-advocacy? Are, um, are you, can you spend the time that we have to be part of the self-advocacy SARTEC advisory committee? So those are all the questions we asked and we were able to have a number of people to be part of it. Well, and let me say this, that in the future, we'll be uh, doing that process again. We and may I, have some spots open, yes. So we may be asking for that very soon. Um, just watch the the uh, Zartec website for those announcements. Again, the Zartec website is selfadvocacyinfo.org. And then I also want to make sure that people know about our internships. Juliana, could you talk for a second about the internship? Yes. Available? Yes. So each year we have opportunities for people with disabilities to be a fellow. And what that requires for an individual with a disability to partner with an organization and create a project or a product that talks about self-advocacy. And I think we're looking a lot about something that can be replicated in different states. And each year we select six individuals to produce a project or product. So the next round, we will be asking for applications at the end of the year. So again, just watch the Zartec website, selfadvocacyinfo.org for those uh, opportunities. Any more questions, Juliana? Yes, we do. Someone wanted to know how to get more information about candidates running for office. Well, you know, um, if you're talking about your local um, elections, or even the national elections, a great place to start is going online and Googling and see what you find. Now you do have to be careful about what's false news and what's you know good news and good facts, but there are some um, different things on different uh, disability organizations. You know, the DD councils will have things on their websites about your state elections and and also about the national elections um not only them but there are some national organizations that will have some stuff on their websites as well so the web the internet's a great place to start you can go to the library um you can attend public forums and hearings um you can go and meet the legis the people that are running themselves right? They have all kinds of material that they will be happy to give you so that you can learn about them. And you can even write them or show up somewhere where they're doing a, a meeting and ask them questions, you know, because I know that when I'm going to vote for somebody, the first thing I want to know is, do they believe that people with disabilities should be able to live in the community? That's a question I want to know what that candidate feels about and stands on before I vote for them, right? Because I believe that people with disabilities should live in the community. 
right? And if a, a legislator doesn't, uh, somebody that's running a candidate doesn't uh, agree with that, I want to know that so I know who I want to vote for, right? So, you know, you might want to think about what are some of the questions that you would like to have answered, right? And then go to those uh, meetings or even contact their uh, election campaign people and, and put those questions to them. A lot of the DD councils uh, do, do public forums. I know the one here in Georgia is organizing one. And they even have uh, like a, a questionnaire that they send to candidates and ask questions and then get the answers and compile those answers into a, a little document that you can download, right? So these are just some ideas. I hope that helps. Yep, and um, there's a couple of places that you can also go to. You can go to the rev up campaigns that some states are doing and Cherie mentioned some of the activities that some states are doing. Also, you can also go to the Secretary of State's website and find more information about candidates. Let's see. I see that Lauren has raised her hand again. Let's see if her microphone is working this time. All right, Lauren, are you there? Hi, Lauren. Okay, it seems like we, we're having a problem with the technology. Lauren, if you could type in your question, I'll be glad to have, answer it, or if you can figure out, if we can figure out how to unmute you. Juliana, what do we got going on technically wise? Um, on our end, I'm able to unmute. I'm just not sure if Lauren has a mic. Lauren, can you check and see if you're unmuted before you try to speak? Hi, Lauren. Are you there? All right, well, Juliana, do we have any other questions? We sure do. Let's see. Um... Yes, Lauren was asking about, can she get on the next session? You sure can. Um, yeah, if you want to join the afternoon, you just need to go and uh, do the registration for it, though. Yes, and again, so, make sure that your microphone works. Yeah. All right, next question is, how can we learn more about advocating for ourselves? Well, um, you can go to the Zartec website and download that uh, toolkit that we just covered. Uh, we didn't go into the whole toolkit. We just covered some of the topics that are covered in that toolkit and just touched on them. Um, but you can download that, first of all. You got anything right. to add to that, Juliana? We have a question from Denise Torres. She's asking if we're going to have a session during the Self Advocates Conference in January 2019. Um, I'm not sure. Is that a national conference or is that your state conference? And I have unmuted. So let me see this. Them. We were at the National SAVE Conference, and I'm sure we will be at the next one. Um, what year What year is the next uh, Self-Advocates Becoming Empowered Conference? The next SAVE Conference would be 2020 in the fall. And that is going to be in Denver, Denver, Colorado. So we will definitely be there. Um, now, for your state conference, you know, we would love for them to contact uh, Self Advocate, the SARTAC, uh, and you can do that through our website. There's probably an email on there and a, a way to contact us and um, invite us, and we can see what we can do around maybe getting somebody who's near you to come and represent SARTAC at your state conference. 
Um, so just have your state conference organizers contact Zartac. And that can be done through the website, which is selfadvocacyinfo.org. Next question, Juliana. All right, I have somebody asking, what does SARTAC stand for? SARTAC stands for the Self Advocacy Resource Technical Assistance Center. Does that help? The next question is, how can you get more support for your organization? Well, you know, again, you can start with our website. Um, we have an online clearinghouse for information and a partnership with, tech, with the regional technical assistance centers. Um, so that's a really great way to start. You can contact your state organization um, and you can even start with your local group. Um, you can contact the DD network and other um, uh, disability organizations as well. You got? You want to add to that, uh, Juliana? Um. Yeah, that would be a good start is going to the selfadvocacyinfo.org and under resources you can write in a topic that you're interested in and looking to see what we do have available. And if not, yes, you can ask and say, hey, we need support and for our organization. What can you do for us? We have technical assistance available for self-advocacy groups and you can request that. Yeah, so you can contact Zartac through the website and uh, let us know specifically what your question is about and we will try our best to help you. And like I said, if you look at the website, you're liable to find something because we do have that resource section. Okay. David Fried, is your, your device, are you able to speak? Should we try you again? Let's try. David is a fabulous advocate. He's on the advisory board for Zartac. And we were hoping that he would get to talk for at least a few minutes. We're still getting the feedback, shoot. Oh no, we're still getting the feedback? Yes. <sighs> David, if you'll type in your comments, we'll read it. How about that? If you could just type in what you want to say, um, I'm sure Juliana will read it for you. If you can if, mute all but one device and we can unmute you. Yeah, because there was some severe feedback going on. Ooh, it was really squealy. So do we have any more questions, Juliana? Uh, not yet. Well, it's 11.15 and we have covered all the PowerPoints. I think we have answered lots of great <laughs> and fabulous questions. Um, again, I just wanna encourage everybody to do the evaluation when you receive it and to go check out the Zartec website because there is just lots of great resources on there and, and lots of stuff that you can use for yourself or for your self-advocacy organization. Any more questions? Did David uh, type in anything? I do not have that available. All right, well, I think we are done. What do you think, Juliana? Are we done? I think so. Wait, so I, I, want to... I have some, a comment here. Oh, we've got a comment now? Great. What's the comment? Oh, someone said they were, thanks for the invite. Oh, thank you. We want to say thank you to everyone. 
who took uh, time out of their day to sit with us on this webinar and to hear about the self-advocacy tool. We hope that you'll use it and that it'll really help to strengthen your self-advocacy in your state and in your life. So thank you so much. Have a good day, everybody.